minutes, 10, 12 minutes or so. Try to give you a little bit of background on the architecture of the Mark Radar on Google Consensus Orbiter. Uh, a little bit about how we acquired data previously. Um, some of our primary and secondary data products. Some sign in double. And a preview of a new operational mode, um, which will be well, which is we've actually just started acquiring data. So first let's get to the architecture. Um, and I'm, I'm mainly going to talk about, almost exclusively talk about the year out of the newer process order, but I'm going to remind you of those are actually two great artists that for a very brief amount of time in the lab, um, and the APL was a part of both of those, there was Ministar on Show Round 1, uh, launched by the Indian Space Research Organization of Israel, um, in 2008, and then we launched the year in 2009 for the process order. Now, for our reasons, these were not duplicates of each other. The uh, radar on Chandra One was uh, had a slightly reduced capacity. Um, it was not able to walk to uh, with the Lunar Council Radar. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Typical images of our of our instrument on both Chandra One and LRO um, rapid foil, so you can't really see see them too well. They were both side uh, 47, 46 degrees, and the other 30. Uh, we look for a new block diagram um, uh, of the instrument. Uh, the thing to, I guess, keep in mind here is that we transmitted circular polarization, uh, circularly polarized signal, uh, and received a uh, linear uh, polarized topography linear uh, HP uh, out the other end of the receiver. Which allowed us to calculate uh, four of its scope spectrum, which is very important for creating a lot of our products. Um, and then we processed, we did some in house processing of the data using uh, some of the virtually available software that has since gone out of business, Excel. Um, my Microsoft Office has been close to that. Uh, but we still have Excel. We use it here, but we don't actually have to use the processor that much anymore, as I'll explain in a bit. Uh, and then Creates those uh, parameters and several other products that we supply to the PDS. So, just some basics for uh, LRO, uh, the, the mini RF had two modes uh, and two wavelengths, so 12.6 centimeter X band, 4.2 centimeter X band. Um, it can operate at a resolution of 150 meters, which is higher sensitivity, lower resolution, or uh, a resolution of 30 meters. So we could get, you know, we could see features in more detail, but it was less sensitive um, in that mode. The shutter one spacecraft only had S band in the baseline mode of 150 meter resolution. As I, as, I, as I mentioned in the previous slide, we measured the turn signals of two or five polarizations to create. Uh, the Stokes factory product. And just here, just to show on the side, is one of our image strips. This is Clementine uh, data in the background. Um, typically, our swap width is between 10 and 15 kilometers, depending on the altitude of the spacecraft the data is acquired. Um, but our strips would range in length about five minutes, uh, where the data is going to be as much as 30 minutes of the data. Um, so it varied. And I'll describe that a little bit. Right here with another data acquisition scenario. So, we were actually a very opportunistic instrument. Uh, we were originally on LRO with a technology demonstration, and we were allocated, if I remember correctly, two four minute takes a month um, to you know, demonstrate the utility of radar. We actually um, came up with a strategy shortly after the launch to use excess download capacity to acquire. Um, a lot more data, essentially, more data on the second four minutes while we were in view of a ground station. Um, essentially, the, the solid state recorder was being emptied by a ground station. We were filling it up with radar data. And luckily, we could empty it faster. Well, the ground station could empty the uh, solid state recorder quicker than we could fill it. So by the time we were out of the ground station, all our data was down, and then normal operations, everybody could do everything they were doing um, previous to seeing the ground station. So, and this really necessitated a very close collaboration with both the LRO project and specifically LRO. We were LRO and the ARF were big data boss on LRO. Um, and so we had to be really careful not to overrun the report. Um, it was a bit of a dance to get as much radar data down while we were in the field of ground station uh, without uh, tripping the alarm on the report and, and putting the spacecraft 
the same uh, But it works. Uh, for the duration that the transmitter um, operated, uh, we collected data covering over two-thirds of the moon uh, at all latitudes, and more than 95% of the latitudes higher than the degrees. Uh, what I'm showing here is just a snapshot of uh, one of our planning scenarios, uh, our operation scenarios. This is actually the year 155 and 2010. Uh, in green, you see some of the coverage we have already acquired of the moon. We actually have a lot of polar coverage, but we masked that because we were in a polar campaign at that point and wanted to see uh, all the polls, see what exactly we were covering again. Um, in red, you see what we were already acquired on a typical day. We had several, um, well, we had two tiers of observation. We had a six minute observation and a 20 minute observation in this particular campaign. Uh, we couldn't take all 20 minute observations in every orbit because Elrock was also trying to take data at the same time. And we had to work with them to try to uh, make sure our resources worked, uh, as I said, that we had to go for the report. Um, but over the course of several days, we could cover a lot of ground. Um, and we actually ended up with. Uh, as I said, they really did cover the poles it's in both east and west looking uh, radar directions um, for both the north and south pole. Uh, and that was really our primary goal for me as a technology demonstration. It's meant to search, sorry, it's meant to search for um, potential evidence of water ice at the poles. And it was a lot of non data as well. I'll show you some of uh, what we've got down back in a minute. Um, so, just to uh, show you some of our primary data products, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we can use four of those dose vector. That comes from uh, the orthogonal polarized signal that was received. It's uh, H and B, horizontal vertical polarizations. Uh, and what we do is we take uh, both H and B and their cross product to produce the four of those dose vector and calculations to that here. And what you end up with, uh, this is, uh, these are orthographic projected mosaics uh, with center longitudes of 40 and 60, covering the entire moon, showing all the data that we acquired um, through the ESMD phase, as it was known then, and the science fiction record phase um, before uh, our Kirkland operation changed. This is S1 data. So we provide all four stokes parameters. It's very important to have all four to calculate some of our secondary products. But if you're looking at a typical, which you can see, typical rate of return, the power of return, what you look at the first stokes back here. So this represents the total power of return from the surface. As I said, um, we have a lot of secondary products that we can produce when we have these four, when we have the four element stokes vectors, um, the four element stokes vector. Um, and this is a list of the more commonly used ones in both uh, terrestrial and interplanetary scenarios. Uh, well, we focus primarily uh, on the circular polarization ratio, and I'll show a little bit of that in a second. And uh, another product related to relative phase. We were initially looking at relative phase as a product. Uh, we discovered the calibration issue that maybe switched to a different, uh, different uh, decomposition technique. Uh, the color stretch doesn't look as good on a projector, uh, but here is a typical CPR, or I think it's a region, this is the crater Burgess A um, on the moon, and this shows a little bit of, of our coverage. You can see we have, you know, in some areas pretty dense coverage, but we don't get places everywhere. I think we're opportunistic when we get in there, but a very regular scenario where our wire can get it. The circular polarization ratio is an indication of the surface roughness at the scale, the weighting scale of the radar. Actually, go up to several weightings, um, several weightings, up to several weightings. Uh, and what it really shows is uh, young fresh craters, they're ejecting deposits, they're blocking deposits with respect to the background terrain. Uh, it's very good at eliminating those. Uh, because we were both our own transmitter and receiver, uh, we could, we didn't have to worry about shadows. Um, so this was this is a great compliment to LROC, uh, where you can get the surface at very high resolution, but occasionally you don't have the right kind of drone and you might miss things. And I'll show you some things that we can see that LROC has a little bit more difficult to see in just a second. Here is that same orthographic projectable product, uh, now with the CPR. 
Um, we did some log generation of the repotents, uh, running the rainfall basin, um, and then more ingredients over here. Another product that we have started using recently uh, is MPI decomposition. I mentioned earlier we were looking at the product in the relative phase. We ended up with this product. It's a little more complicated, and basically what it does is it takes the data and decomposes it into the scattering properties of the surface. Um, and this, this can be very important, I'll show an example of why. In a minute, here's the calculations that it creates an RGB image where we use first stokes parameter and some calculations using other stokes parameters, the degree of polarization, which I showed earlier, and sine to pi, calculation that's here. Um, and this scenario red is double bounce backscatter, so even backs essentially. Uh, blue is, is odd axis. Uh, and green is random polarized uh, polar, uh, of the radar. And what this can tell us. Uh, double metal back scatter is an indicator, a potential indicator for volumetric ice, positive volumetric ice. Um, green, again, it's, it's, it's an essential volume scatter within uh, several wavelengths of the surface. And frag scatter is the dominant component of the single metal back scatter. And this image this is the same image I showed here, where what you see is a very high CDR uh, around this particular crater, crater extends for a fair distance, about 70 kilometers before it starts to get more diffuse. Um, and in this region, when we start to decompose the scattered particles, you see um, actually very high amounts of double bounce and random polarized signal uh, close to the crater, crater associated with continuous jet blanket. But then it gets diffused much more quickly, um, so you get to this kind of background terrain. The background of the terrain is not only blue in this particular product, uh, representing a predominance of rack scattering. Uh, it doesn't mean all you have is rack scattering, just easy predominance. Again, this little product where the record is actually showing um, the impact of composition. So, in the archive, I'll uh, wrap up just a little bit. Uh, we we in the archive with the ESG Sciences node at level one, we provide the HMB and uh, real management component of the cross product. At level two, we provide a lot of products. Uh, Map projected, HMB, complex. We provide all four SOAPS parameters. We provide opposite same sense polarization, which is something that is used uh, in uh, ground based literature uh, looking at the moon, and we provide circular polarization, which uh, we do not provide at uh, this stage. Um, I want to flip the science, um, because it's not primarily the science uh, being around. Uh, but here in the search for ice, you know, looking for CDR signatures, um, it might be indicative of ice on the surface. It's not conclusive with our non-static data, um, it's suggestive. Um, and again, looking at this crater where it's A, where you had a very extensive ejection blanket here, or any other, this is visible, LR WAC data, you see um, high value of material suggesting uh, the ejection uh, area. And when you look at CPR, again, it's very high for a, a, a fair distance. When you get to the scattering, again, it's very, it's lower, much quicker. And what we uh, interpret this to be is we're seeing through the ejection blanket of Virgin A into the back of the lunar back of the beneath. Um, so what we can do with this product is potentially uh, measure the thickness out at some distance. Um, we can have implications for modeling and that process. Again, some of the things we can see that uh, LR can't necessarily see easily uh, impact no flows emitting um, from from various craters. New mode of operation we're, we're in right now. We had a uh, anomaly on transmitter on uh, December of 2010. Uh, it hasn't functioned since. But now we're operating in static mode where we transmit uh, a 200 kilowatt signal from air SIBO and bounces off the moon receive it um, at the spacecraft LRL. The, uh, the implication here is volumetric ice and rock materials to both have high CDRs at beta zero when you're looking at uh, the monostatic radar, which is transmitting the surface and receiving from one detector. But when you go to higher beta angles, um, because the high CDR for volumetric water ice is due to put your backscatter, um, it drops off very quickly um, and CDR values are all rock design. Um, so we're looking forward to uh, looking at this mode. Here's uh, data kind of fresh down on the ground from about uh, two weeks ago, uh, where we used the surface. Uh, this is an extra monostatic data, an uh, example of a strip of monostatic data. Um, and this is the bi-static uh, signal uh, return to process the data, which has never been done before. Um, and we'll all of that just to show some effects. And we'll stop it.
<laughs> That's all right. We're a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, questions for this talk? I have one. Uh, as a representative of the PDS Geoscience Node, and this is one of our largest data sets, in this uh, new... <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm curious about the new operation mode and how often you you'll do this and how much data that's likely to yeah, generate so in what areas of the planet. Yeah, uh, we're, we're going to try to focus on the poles because again, this, this is this could be a great indicator of why nature's positive water and looking for that. Uh, we're going to try to take most of the polar data all over the control and also to look at some other problems because I'm regular. I'm going to take some editorial data as well, looking at high CDR regions, regions where we know it's the rocky material that's causing the CDR, so we can kind of see the fall. Basically, we want to make measurements at various points along this uh, mega curve. Um, or not, because of the complexity of the operations, now we have Arecibo involved, we have the time in Arecibo, uh, and Arecibo was built to work every time you want it to, you know, and, and it's not like a perfect spacecraft where every, you know, bit counts. Um, so occasionally, uh, we'll set something up and then something, uh, there's a glitch on your CO um, and, and among other things, just trying to make sure that we get the right bystander angle, um, and then the, the, we have to roll the spacecraft on sometimes all the axes to get in position to uh, proceed the signal that they're looking for. That's a complex operation. We're probably going to do this, we'd like to do it a couple times a month. Uh, and we really, obviously, are part of the state of the PDS. Uh, we're still working on some of the processing. It's a bit more complex um, processing scenario. We don't use Excel software so that we use our own static data. Uh, we actually save the lab processes as well. Um, so um, it's, it's, there's not going to be as much volume in here as much. Uh, but it's a, but hopefully, uh, it will be very illuminating. <laughs> All right, other uh, questions for this paper? Okay, I think we're ready for our break, but before we go, a reminder.